I never thought it would win the debut national award and all that. We just thought let's let's just try and make something interesting because nobody was funding the film. So I thought let let me prove them wrong that I could make a movie. <laughs> and film school when I saw those films I thought god you can make a film without any money and all you need is a good script and some a bunch of equally mad actors who are willing to you know give give you time. Hi, this is Melanie Pardesi Reviews. I was honored to be able to interview director Mohan Krishna Indraganti. We had such a long discussion that I'm going to break up the interview into four parts. This first part, we discuss his national award-winning film, Grahanam. Part two will be a discussion of Nani's debut film, Ashtachama. Then we'll talk about Samahanam. And then finally, in part four, we'll talk about the upcoming film, V, which is going to be released on September 5th on Amazon Prime. So here we go with part one of my fabulous interview with Mohan. Hi, this is Melanie of Pradesi Reviews, and I'm here with a special interview, director Mohan Krishna Indragati, the director of films like Grahanam, the award-winning film, Ashtachama, uh, Nani's very first film, uh, Gentleman, Samahanam, and the upcoming V, which is coming to Amazon Prime on September 5th. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining me Thank today you. for this Thank discussion. You. So you. did you always want to be a filmmaker? You come, see, I've read that you come from a family of writers and you studied English. You have a master, an advanced degree, a master's degree in English. So did you always want to be a filmmaker or did you dream of being a writer and then kind of switch course? Um, uh, I don't, I think I was always interested in, uh, in cinema, I think from, from my childhood. I, I didn't know that till my friends reminded me recently that when I was in my 10th grade, I used to really bug them with you know, telling stories, whatever films I watched, I used to, apparently I used to come back and narrate to them frame to frame by frame. So they, <laughs> they, they, they now tell me that we always thought you would be a filmmaker, but, but, but I think it's around my graduation that I thought I should become actually a filmmaker. I didn't, I was, I was in love with the cinema. I was, I was in love with the, the medium, but I never thought I, I, I didn't even know what it meant to be a director of a film. You know, I thought, mm. I didn't know what they would do, what they did and all that. So it's after my uh, graduation, I think that I decided that I think I should try my hand at filmmaking because then I thought, looks like I'm actually interested in this. Looks like I may have something to offer here. And uh, doing my grad graduation, undergrad in literature and my post-graduation in literature also helped me because there's a, this close connect between literature and cinema is something that you know I always found fascinating. Uh, and it's actually funny that it's the, the importance of the earnest, which I adapted as Ashta Chamma, I read that in my undergrad during a very casual break from my classes when my teacher said, why don't you go to the library and you know do some reading? I just picked it up randomly and read it. And I remember thinking, hey, this will make a great movie in, in Telugu if, if, if anybody could adapt it. And much, much later, I, have, I did it uh, <laughs> quite surprisingly. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was, I think, probably around my graduation uh, when I was finishing my graduation and uh, uh, undergrad, I mean, and I was uh, I was registering for my postgrad in literature in, at the University of Hyderabad, that I thought, you know, maybe after this I should I should uh, get into filmmaking, but I didn't want to work as an assistant director to anybody because I thought that would take too long. So once I finished my masters in MPhil in English literature, uh, I I went to Canada, I went to Toronto, I did my masters there in film uh, from York wow. University. I did my uh, MFA in, in screenwriting there. And then I came back in 2001 and as usual, went around all the studios, uh, find, trying to find a, find a backer. And then in 2004, I didn't find anybody uh, who would produce Grahanam. So then a couple of friends uh, came forward and gave me like six lakh rupees. I don't know how much that would be in dollars, <laughs> but it's like, right. it's virtually pittance. So I made my first film with that budget. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's, so different from your other films yeah, it's, yeah, i would yeah. call it parallel cinema amazing, um amazing. i absolutely oh. loved it yeah, and thank you, thank you so much <laughs> so and i read that you got um Bar barani to 
who I have been so familiar seeing him as a character, more of a comedic actor in many television yeah. films. And for me, it was a delight to see him in a straight drama kind of role. Yeah. But I read that he agreed to do the film without compensation. Actually, none of the actors uh, took any salary for that. Uh, they just did it for free. Uh, we gave some honorariums to actually Mr. Bharani and uh, Jayalalitha who did the female lead. And most of the other senior actors did not take. We gave honorariums to upcoming actors who did these big parts. 1,000, 2,000 rupees, 3,000 rupees. And all the technicians more or less worked for free. Um, and so it was, it was crazy. And I was also at the time influenced by Dogma 95. I don't know if you, you, you would have heard of this mm -mm. movement in Danish uh, filmmaking movement, which prepared a ten, the Ten Commandments of filmmaking, where they said okay. there shouldn't be any makeup, no costume design, no, wow. no, no lighting, no sound editing, nothing. It's, it's a ten, ten rule uh, commandments that they prepared. Uh, this, this was pioneered by Thomas Winterberg, who made a film called Festen. Danish film called Festen. I think you should check it out. It's called Ce The Celebration. It's called okay. Celebration in English. It's called Festen. And, uh, and of course, you, you, you must have heard of uh, uh, Lars von Trier, right? Mm -hmm. uh, who, who made yes. all these crazy yeah. films. Um, these yeah. guys have started this movement in, in, in I think, in, Scandin in Denmark in mm -hmm. the 90s. And I think it's in, in 95. I think. That's why it's called Dogma 95. So when, when we, in film school, when I saw those films, I thought, God, you can make a film without any money. And all you need is a good script and some, a bunch of equally mad actors who are willing to you know, give, give you time yeah. and, and, and uh, their efforts. So uh, that's how it started. So, and it's, you could see a lot of influence of Satyajit Ray and, and all these parallel filmmakers, you know, who, who I admired. Right. Uh, so it was, it was quite an adventure. I never thought it would win the debut national award and all that. We just thought, let's, let's just try and make something interesting because Nobody was funding the film. So I thought, let, let me prove them wrong, that I could make a movie. <laughs> that was the sole intention at the time. But yeah, turned out to be much more than what I thought. Uh, can you tell me about the choice you made to make the film in black and white, except for one particular, I don't know if I want to call it a dream sequence or yeah, a, yeah, you know, yeah. a, a, a memory sequence is the only part that's in color. Um, it, it was a it, it was, it was a, actually quite an accidental choice. We were filming uh, on digital. Actually, now we shot this film on digital and later transferred it to film because we didn't have the money, obviously. So we were shooting on a, a reasonably, uh, not reasonably, we were shooting on a, actually a very low-end camera. It's called Panasonic DVX 100A, which is basically a news gathering camera. You know? Okay. Uh, and we were we were filming in color, and suddenly one day when we, we I was not happy with the authenticity of. What I thought this digital is making it look making it look artificial, you know. Yeah. Although we were shooting in a house, with uh, we didn't do any art direction for the film actually. Much of that that furniture wa was real, I and mean, it, it the house was like 120 years old or something, you know. Yeah. Where we were filming, and the, uh, the furniture was actually that old, but color was making it look rich, making mm. it look artificial. So I just I was I had a small monitor and I just turned it turned it to monochrome. Wow. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this, this looks right. Let's make this in black and white. And then we shot the rest of the film looking at a black and white monitor. And I told my cinematographer, Vinda, who we both debuted together. I said, let's do this. And then Vinda said, oh, you should have told me this. I was, I was lighting for something else. <laughs> but, then, but then we managed in the post somehow to grade it to a uh, black and white, high contrast. You know, slightly, we, we sort of toyed with the contrast and made it look once I shifted to black and white, it started really looking much more authentic. You know, the, the period started coming across. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It, uh, and, and we thought, you know, this is looking more authentic. And then when I was actually editing the film, and I thought the story is rather, rather bleak. It, 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 he's like recounting yeah. the flashback, which is full of pain. And then how did we, if I shift to color, when he's thinking of the fondest memories of her, of her, with, with her, you know, then yeah. I, I just, I thought I would just insert that small portion in color so that people also will have this you know i i remember when i screened it there was a, a buzz in the theater when it suddenly yeah. changed to color you know people knew you know there was an immediate connect with the memory uh, except that, so that was a conscious choice the color was a conscious choice but the black and white was a complete accident <laughs> <laughs> but it worked out yeah yeah it worked out thankfully it, it worked out very well because like you say it set i don't know it set a mood it set a period it, 
I don't know. And and um, Jaya Lalita's performance. Oh my gosh! <laughs> like, I mean, everyone yeah. was very good. Funny thing but was, it, I was I, blown away. I was. Jaya Lalita uh, is, uh, is actually. I don't know if you've seen her other films. She's known to be playing these sexy seductress, sexy. Uh, you know, all these really B movie. Okay. Sexy, I I've only seen her I, like as the Speaker of the House yeah, in Baranadi yeah. Nand. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I when I it, what's weird is that's the, that's the most interesting part about the film that also speaks about the the mindset with which people watch the film. Mm. Uh, people thought, oh, a lot of people came to me and told me because you cast Jayalalitha, we thought there was some relationship between her and the boy, you know, oh. which was the weirdest part for me because it has nothing to do with her. It's nothing to do with the role she played earlier in other films. So the way a lot of men looked at a certain type of portrayal of women in films and what assumptions they made about that woman's real character kind of seeped into the way they judged Grahanam and Jayalalitha's character in the film. Mm. You know, they thought Jayalalitha, because it's Jayalalitha who played this role, oh, Mohan must have cast her because there must have been some illicit relationship between the boy and, and, and her. Uh, which is the strangest thing for me. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, she was a surprise casting. And like you were saying, a lot of people are quite shocked by how well she could she could actually perform I mean, in spite of all the bad, stupid films she did. I mean, some of the films you, you can't even believe you see. I mean, it's really, wow. really bad. Bad, degrade, you know, uh, highly, highly objectified, sexualized imagery of Jayalalitha has nothing to do with, you know, what we did in, in, in Grahana. So why, what about this short story compelled you that you wanted to make this your first film? I mean, I just thought it was such an amazing, compelling story, but it's, to be honest with you, it's something that's very different than most mm -hmm. Telugu films that I have seen. Yeah. Not that yeah. I have seen much parallel cinema of Telugu films, but. There's not much to see also for you. <laughs> There's very little of parallel <laughs> cinema. <laughs> when people keep asking me, what, what kind of films do you make? Is it mainstream or offbeat? I say, I make upstream films because it's so difficult to get funding for my movies. But the thing is, uh, the reason I was, in, I was really excited about it was uh, partly because of my education, partly because of my, uh, my uh, exposure to media studies and film studies and history of cinema and, history, uh, and my, my exposure to feminist studies and all that. What, what fascinated me was the way women's bodies were, different tools you were used to shape and control female sexuality, you know, mm. uh, in different settings, it's different. I think sometimes it's superstition. Sometimes it's, it's fashion. Sometimes it's, it's, uh, yeah. and th there, there's this unseen monitoring of female sexual behavior that took different forms in different cultures. And in this, it was the monitoring that the, 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 sex, the monitoring of the sexual behavior of women in a certain, but in a certain time, at a certain time in a particular society and how it, it, it becomes so important for people to know what her sexual behavior is, even, even in her private space, you know. There's a scene where mm. she removes her, that, that thread, sacred thread. Yes, and it, yes. And then she goes and then immediately the mother-in-law says, why don't you, you know, you should put it back. I remember a lot of women said, no, 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 that's actually inauthentic. You know, nobody does it in that. I said, how do you know? How do you know that nobody ever did it? I'm sure a lot of women must have removed it during it, but it, it's just the assumption that, that, so there is that, that monitoring is what I was interested in. And mm. the, 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 the inexplicable, inexplicable desire for men to know, you know, about mm. a woman's private life, you know, and, and the, and the assumptions they have. And, and then how as a mere coincidence can ruin somebody's life. Yeah. The, the doctor's medicine coincides with the shaman's medicine and then, you know, the timing just matched, that's all. But right. it's also inspired by the writer, of course, is, is not alive anymore. But I, when I took the permission from the daughter of the writer, uh, she told me that it, it, the story was inspired by a true, true life incident. Wow. It actually happened. Yeah. And uh, wh what's even more bizarre is when, when I won the national award and, and during the after party, when I was meeting some of the jury members, and one of the jury members is from another state called Maharashtra. Mumbai mm -hmm. is... Uh, mm -hmm. He yep. told me that in Maharashtra, similar practices existed in the 19th century. And he had personally seen some of his relatives being affected by this, this superstition. 
So that was a shocker for me. Wow. But uh, that's what really fascinated me as to why, what is this? What is this? How did you come to the conclusion? Actually, in the original, in the original case that inspired the writer, it's not even blood from the thigh, it's menstrual blood. Mm. You have to make a, a paste from the menstrual blood and then put it in the eye of the victim, whatever it is, you know. That's and because the writer thought it's too harsh, he changed it to blood from the thigh, which would suggest what actually was was intended, you know. Right. So, right. Uh, uh, so I, I, it was a very painful film uh, to shoot. Actually, for my first film, as you rightly said, it's, it's very difficult because I had to handle an actress who was very senior to me, and I had to ask her to do these things. You know, like you know, to explain to her what what this meant, and she was extremely understanding, and and she really put everything into it. You know, believed in it. I mean, and the the scene where um, Barney just loses his trust of her yeah, and then yeah. strikes her. Uh, wow. I mean, that's a scene that I am never going to forget. It's just right. such an impactful yeah. scene. Even while they were performing, it was, it was bizarre because I remember when Barani slapped her, she really slapped him back hard. <laughs> Actually, she did it. <laughs> and Barani did, took it and he said, good. And you could see, if you see the film, you could see uh, uh, his, his, his eyes tear up. Because of the impact, you wow. know, and and he didn't, he didn't cut. He didn't cut. He, he just took it and went with it. And then later told me he was joking with Jayalalita. You must be having a grudge, <laughs> a long, long, a long-standing grudge. But but she was very apologetic. But he said, no, no, no. That is the right thing to do. I mean, it just worked. It would have been so impactful if you didn't do it. So it was. It, they were so involved in it, and it, it took a while for them to come out of the scene. Also after doing it. So that was taxing. Yeah, for us. yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure because uh, they just went to very dark places in yeah, that scene, yeah. and it just yeah, I can imagine. Um, yeah, and I kind of you know once I got the way through, I kind of got the reveal that the doc who the doctor was going to end up being. I just yeah, I just love the um, I love the film so much, and uh, so <laughs> very deserving of the national debut directorial okay. award. Come back and see part two of my interview with director Mohan Krishna Indraganti, where we discuss his film Ashtachama, which was Nani's debut film. I went and told Nani, I have, a new, I have news for you. He said, what? And Nani, by the time, was so much in love with this role, Sinis, that he was literally heartbroken when I told him we have to play the lead. He said, no, no, I don't want this. He was like, sir, I like this a lot. I don't want this. I said, look, look. And afterwards, if anybody is looking for a new lead actor, it will be you. 